Anyway, um, I got some patterns here for everybody and they're already traced out, but I want to explain to you where this pattern came from, okay? This pattern came from last year, uh, I spent the, uh, my wife and I spent uh, about five weeks in Montana. We decided Texas gets too dang hot. Um, and so we spent um, five weeks up there. And while we were there, we went and visited uh, the Charlie Russell Museum up in uh, Great Falls, Montana. Uh, Charlie Russell, the, the great Western artist, he was um, awesome and it's always an inspiring place to go. Um, and I can tell you lots of stories about that. But while we were there, one of the things that they had on display there was his saddle. Um, he had a saddle, uh, and it was in pretty good shape. Uh, Charlie Russell's personal saddle? Charlie Russell's personal saddle was on display there. They had it in a glass case, and I took some pictures of it. And I'll, In fact, you can pass these around if you would, Denise, so that everybody... I'll take care of this table. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, when you get that, on the very last page of this uh, thing that I have here is a picture of this saddle, and I'll put it here. I don't know where you're, where the camera's at right at the moment. Here we go. So what you're looking at there is, is Charlie Russell's saddle, and I was able to get around on the backside. It was behind a, a glass case or under a, you know, a glass case, and I went around to the far side of it there, and I got zoomed in on the, the seat jockey here, um, and that seat jockey there just, I thought, man, that is so cool. Well, what made it cool is who made this saddle. This saddle was built by a guy by the name of Frank Menia. Frank Menia was a saddle maker in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Frank Menia started building saddles in Cheyenne, Wyoming in 1868. Okay, uh, in fact, Cheyenne, Wyoming wasn't even Cheyenne, Wyoming. It was Cheyenne, Wy uh, Wyoming territory then. His first maker stamp said Cheyenne WT on it. Um, and uh, that's how far back it goes. 1868, he was building saddles before like Custer's Last Stand when he was building saddles when Billy the Kid was still running around doing his shenanigans. Uh, uh, he, he built saddles for uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He built saddles for um, Buffalo Bill, uh, Charlie Russell, you know, he, he was the guy, you know, if you wanted to, to have a saddle that was built by the, the most um, well-known saddle maker of the day, he would have been the guy you went to. He died in, I think it was 1928, um, and uh, uh, I think at that time, they, so you're looking at probably the original Wyoming style of leather carving here if you're looking for styles, but um, he died uh, then, and I, I think Don King, the father of Sheridan style carving, would have been eight years old then or something like that. So anyway, he goes back a long ways. But anyway, I took that design and I decided, you know, if we, if we had tools today, if he had the tools that I have today, how would he have done this? You know, because when you look at that picture that, of what he did, you know, he didn't have a place like Springfield to go buy some tools to, to do that design. He had, in fact, probably he made the tools that he used to carve that with. It's pretty plain. It, it's pretty plain. He did, he did what he did with what he had to do it with, you know, and, and um, that was, uh, well, that's how leather work was done there. A lot of what we have today comes as a result of that. Um, you know, a lot of the tools we have today are, um, are modifications of what guys like that might have originally come up with by sharpening up a nail or, you know, working on a bolt or something like that. So anyway, that's where our, our craft came from, and it's been um, evolving ever since that. And I've got a whole bunch of samples here of all the different regional styles, and, and I'll show those to you as we go through the day, but I want to get us started here because we got some carving to do. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll get started with that. Um, the piece of leather that you have, I don't know, I, I guess you probably cut that out of some Herman Oak or yes. something. Okay, so you have no excuses about the leather you're using. So, all right. And I'm going to take away another one of the excuses. You know, one of the other things that people struggle with a lot when they are um, working on a piece of leather is maintaining the proper moisture content in it. Um, moisture content has everything to do with the results you get out of a piece of leather. And uh, the instruction books that they have out there um, usually say, wet it down and go to work on it. Well, what is that? You know, how, how, much, how much do you wet it down? What's, what's the right amount of moisture to put in there? Do you like soak it, just run it until no more water will go in or what? 
Well, um, what I do, and, and uh, again, I guess uh, just to make sure you understand, you're learning how to do leather work the way I do it. <laughs> um, I have my opinions too. Um, but uh, So when I dampen down a piece of leather initially, I dampen it down with enough water so that the moisture gets at least halfway through that piece of leather. I don't want it soaked all the way through because you don't get the color out of it and, you, and it's things want to close back up when you do that. So I dampen it down. That's why I use a sponge and water because I find that spray bottle sometimes it'll look as wet as that with a spray bottle but that moisture is right on the surface of the leather. I want that moisture down into the middle fibers of that piece of leather. And here's where you start asking those questions like, well why? Why is that important? Yeah. <laughs> What about people who case the leather, actually saturate it, and put it in the refrigerator in a plastic bag overnight? And then... If that makes them happy, they should do that. Well, well, how do you do that? The leather is completely saturated. Yep. And then you have to take it out, and then you have to let it start drying back. And you know what? That's old school stuff. That's, that's probably somebody that learned something from somebody that didn't have Herman Oak or leather that works like we have today. Back in the day, um, yeah, you used to have to sweat your leather. That's what they called that. They would dampen. They'd actually put it in a in a in a, a horse tank, you know, f and until the water quit coming out of it or the bubbles, oh, yeah. yeah, quit coming out of it. And then they would um, uh, put it in a bag or whatever and let it sit overnight, and then take it the next day uh, and lay it out. And when it got just right, then go to work on it, you know. And that's how they would do it. We don't have to do that today. I can get the same results. You can't tell a lick of difference between what I do and somebody that let it soak overnight or do that overnight. That results is still what's most important. People get hung up on the process. You have to do this and then you have to do this and you have to do this and if I don't do that it ain't going to look right. Well who cares? When you get all done nobody's going to look at this and say, now did you let that soak overnight? That's not what's important. People get hung up on the wrong things. Get hung up on the results you're producing. And, it, and, and fortunately, leather technology has gotten a lot better. It, we, we have better leather today than we have ever had available to us ever in the history of leatherworking. Okay? So now that you've got your leather properly cased, that's dampen it about halfway through. Um, we'll get a design on there. But uh, So you can't blame the leather. And you can't. And, and the other thing is, we got to keep it moist uh, all the way through this process. So that means we'll have to dampen it down again once or twice as we go. Uh, but when I dampen it again, I'm going to just dampen the surface. The moisture is now down in those middle fibers, and I need to maintain that as we go. So, you all, nobody's asked about this cardboard on the back yet, have you? Uh, why did I do that? Uh, huh? I was going to ask you. Okay. Let let me ask you. Part of that is I. Um, well, what yeah, the why is you know, sometimes I'm using a piece of I think this is probably six ounce leather. I don't. Yeah, this what is did seven you, eight. Okay, so yours a little heavier. This is doesn't matter. This is just uh, a, a a carving, and so whether it stretches a little bit doesn't matter. But this is old habits for me. I always tend to laminate things to um, a piece of leather or to a piece of cardboard like this primarily to keep it from stretching out of shape. But there's another reason I do it as well and that's to, to help me get a, the most uh, depth out of a piece of leather that I can. And let me give you an illustration. Here's my illustration. Here's a piece of, uh, this is uh, Arizona style leather carving. This was uh, a piece that I did, but uh, I actually drew this design with, alongside of Rocky Minster, who's one of the last guys that worked for Porter Saddlery, which is where this all originated. Anyway, um, and, and I did this on some like um, two, three ounce leather, but I got a lot of depth out of it, as you can see, because it was glued down to this piece of Cardboard, and I don't know. We'll try this again. If you, can you see that? Is your yes? You all, yeah. Look at that piece of cardboard. That design is like just as much carved in that piece of cardboard as it was on the piece of leather. And if you run, your, were able to run your hand. In fact, I'll pass it around. You can. If you run your hand over the back of this. Um, Are you saying the depth comes from the knife cuts or the no. backgrounder? Or? No. <laughs> no. Uh, what I'm saying is that I actually carved deeper than what this leather was thick. And the reason I was able to do that is when I did my beveling, my shading, my backgrounding and all that, 
um, I stamped it deep enough that it this here absorbed some of those impressions. I pushed this leather down with those tools deeper than this leather's thick. And so when you get uh, when you're working on lightweight leathers, um, that's one of the ways you can get more depth out of your carving. The other reason, of course, is to keep it from stretching out of shape. A lot of people will use the the packing tape like this or something, you know, uh, uh, this painter's tape, but something like that on the back to keep from stretching. Don't worry about it today. What you're working on, I don't care if it stretches. It isn't going to be a big deal. You can trim it down to whatever frame you want to put it in. If you're going to frame it, that's not going to be an issue. But I wanted to explain to you the why. Why do I do this? Okay, so that's why I do it. It's to get the max out of it. Um, I've got that? some really thin stuff up here, even thinner than this that I did the same thing with. So, Jim, um, do you use uh, like a rubber cement to laminate? I, yes, sir. I do. Rubber cement's what I use. Off, right? uh, well, sometimes, sometimes the cardboard wants to come with it, um, and I don't it, care. It, it depends hard. on what I'm going to use it for. But if I am c concerned that that uh, the back is going to be gummy or sticky or have cardboard on it, then what I'll do is I'll put this uh, tape on it first and then glue it down to the cardboard with, with uh, rubber cement and then I can pull it off and if it comes off I can always peel the tape off. So anyway, there, that's what I do. Anyway, enough about that. Y'all are asking about process and you're not carving any leather yet, so get your leather wet. Um, we got to get this design traced on there. Um, th there are, well, the, on this one here, you notice that I put these little uh, corner patterns in here. Uh, well, in fact, while you're doing that, um, let me explain where those came from. When I looked at his pattern here, I had to modify this pattern quite a bit. Um, I had, um, he had these little, um, he had these little uh, things up here in the corner um, that, I mean, I, I didn't, I had to modify that, and so uh, the way I modified that is I, I created these little, uh, this little leaf thing here, and so when I made the corners, uh, some corner patterns for this piece, I, I basically modified that, and so that's where those came from. Those actually, these little corner uh, patterns that are on here came as a modification of what he originally did, so anyway, so uh, you can put those on if you want. Um, they, uh, uh, your piece of leather, you cut this basically the same size as what I've got. This is a 9 by 12 piece of leather that I have. I think this is like 9 by 11 and 3 quarters. 11 and 3 quarters. So anyway, just bring it in. Uh, on your tracing pattern, a couple things I'd have you notice here. On your tracing pattern, there's a, um, there's a, uh, a line on the outside here, kind of like a border. That border is actually so that you can place these corner patterns into the corner and, at, and have them at the right distance away from the corner. So that's, what that's why those are there. Um, the, uh, there's a single line, you'll notice, running around this oval, but on the pattern, or on the finished carving here, it's a double line. So that's why I had you bring some wing dividers with you so that... Um, you can, uh, we can do that. So I don't, whenever I have a double line like that, I don't ever trace both lines. I can barely trace one line straight. Try to get in two that, that are parallel to each other, it's, it's hopeless. But, um, so anyway, that's what I do. So with that, I've talked long enough. My leather's starting to come back to its original color a little bit. And you know what, that's just about right. Often what I will do, and this one, um, if, if I can, is I'll tape things down. But I don't like to tape directly onto the leather, so um, what I'll do with the, to fix that is I'll, I'll make it a little bigger so that I can tape it down to the leather. Anyway, that's what I do. I, I improvise a lot. Um, so, so who here has been doing leather work the longest? That's probably the next thing. This is... I started um, at age 11, so um, anybody start earlier than that? <laughs> These are all younger than you. They're all younger than I am, yeah. I know that. Um, so. I am the old guy here, so that means you all can't make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> Now that laugh scares me just a little bit. Um, <laughs> and so when I'm using a stylus, sometimes some of these smaller patterns 
those lines get so close together that if, well, if you use a big old fat ball end stylus to uh, uh, do your tracing, sometimes those lines all run together and that, that you're already starting out with trouble. So, um, so I, uh, I, I've sharpened mine and what I did is I, I literally I took it on a sharpening stone like you would a knife and just brought it down to a finer tip. I guess you could do it with a grinder or whatever, but and but it's not sharp to a point, you know, where it's you could run it through the leather. It's then polished off on the end. I actually, after I got it um, as fine as I wanted it, then I rounded it off so that um, it would have a nice smooth uh, point on it. So that as I go over this paper, I'm not tearing through it. Uh, it glides over, over the top. In fact, I, I polish all my tools. Um, not just the swivel knife. I polish my modeling spoons. I polish my, my stylus. Uh, all these things. They're, you can't never have your tools working too smooth or having them work too well. Um, what kind of tracing film is this? Um, well, it's not tracing film. It's, it's actually vellum? It's, it's vellum. Yeah, it's tracing paper, uh, and it's uh, what the, I do teach a lot of classes. And yeah, you know, we could use up the first 25, 30 minutes of this class with y'all tracing it from a pattern onto some film, and then from there onto the leather. But this here really speeds things up for me to just have um, this already uh, on there. So I I just run this through a copy machine uh, and. Uh, uh, or a laser printer actually is what it is and um, you all have the the same tracing pattern I have so you know, one of the things that, that I, I see happens and it's happened to me so I assume it has with everybody else but sometimes when I'm tracing a pattern from you know an outline onto the tracing film it's possible you can get off the lines just a little bit and then when you go from there from the tracing material onto the leather, it's possible to get off just a little bit again. And you know what? Next thing you know, you've already got your line distorted before you ever put a knife to it. And so I think, um, and one of the things I usually tell folks in all my classes is that when you're doing, uh, putting a design like this, any design, I don't care what you're doing, onto a piece of leather, this is, right now is when you need to focus up. Right now is when you need to be doing your very best, most accurate job because you know what? Right now you're laying down the road map that you're going to have to follow with your swivel knife. And the lines that you cut with your swivel knife are the lines you have to follow with the beveler. And you know what? If, if they're not where they need to be right now, it don't get better. You know, it, it, you need to you know, kind of make sure you're accurate right here at this stage. So sometimes people get in a hurry. You know, let's get this done so we can start cutting on it. Well, don't get in that big a hurry. Uh, one of the things that... Um, one of the reasons I know so much about doing leather work is because I've done it wrong. Every way you can imagine to do it wrong. <coughs> I promise you, I've ruined more leather than a lot of you have ever touched. Jim, is it all right for the tape to land on the leather? Um, yeah, if that's what you do. Um, but I'd rather you didn't. And, and the why, the why of that is that sometimes, you, well, you can leave a little bit of that sticky on there, but more more often it'll pull the grain a little bit when you pull it off of the leather, and so. If you do, fine, we'll figure out how to make that work. There are tools called matting tools, background tools that cover up stuff like that. So we, there's always a way to get work around that. They say that what, the difference between a professional and a beginner really is that a professional knows how to cover up his mistakes better. <laughs> or that from Denny. <laughs> <laughs> I would rival you in the amount of leather that's coming in. <laughs> well, hopefully with every one of those pieces that I messed up, I learned something from it. Yeah. 
you know, you learn from your mistakes as well as as others. But what I hope to do is to shorten some of that learning curve for you today, by showing you some of the things I learned the hard way, or some things I learned not to do the hard way. So anyway. This is going to be, a, you know, this and the cutting is going to be about as quiet as it gets in here and then it'll get louder as everybody starts hammering at the same time. So here's where you all need to be talking and sharing uh, sharing your uh, leatherworking uh, stories. And, man, I got stories. You know, we're, we're recording this, right? Or, or, or at least it's on camera, so... What I say, well, I'll have to live with, right? <laughs> I got, I have to kind of be careful here. Um, no, I, you know, the first time I ever did um, a, a class, a, a leatherwork demonstration in front of a camera, was uh, well, it would have been back in the late seventies. Okay, so the cameras then were not these little things, you know, look like a like a, a camera they were like big old movie projector type things you know they they were huge it's the kind of stuff they they have in the tv studios and um the situation was i was in uh bozeman montana i was uh they had asked they had a gathering of uh, the 4-h leaders for the state and they asked you know if i could come up and do a demonstration for them and i did and they said i asked you know what how how many people are going to be there? And they said, oh, I don't know. We usually get, you know, maybe 15, 20 folks that come to these. And I said, well, I'll be all right. And so I went up there and showed up, and they had me in an auditorium. That mm -hmm. auditorium was full. It had about 85 people in it, something like that. I don't know. I didn't count. I was petrified already. And then they had these cameras in front of where I was going to do do my work, you know. And I said, what's, what's that? And he said, well... If it's all right, you know, everybody wouldn't fit into this room, so we've got another room over here <laughs> that's got another 40 people in it, and so we're going to, you know, shoot this over there to them. And if it's all right, we'll record it too, and then we can, you know, share it with 4-H groups around the, the state. And anyway, first time ever in a front of a group that size, and then do it in front of a movie camera or, or you know, like that. So... I'm sitting there doing little stuff like I'm doing right now, and I'm just petrified. My my, my hand is just like shaking all over the place, and I, I'm I'm tongue tied. I can't talk. You know, it's it's that kind of a thing, and um, I've kind of gotten over that. I like the way you did that in a low key voice. What? I've kind of gotten over that. <laughs> God, yes. It almost sounded convincing. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think here. What is the biggest bunch I've ever done? Um, I don't know. What is the biggest bunch I've ever done? I know I've done some stuff online back when the COVID stuff set in, and everybody decided to. They, oh well, they, everybody didn't decide that, but. There were some in our world that said, y'all need to just stay home. Um, and I said, you know, wow, what a great opportunity. We could do this online and people could learn to do leather work while they're having to stay at home. And so I started doing some online classes and stuff. And when that word got around that that's what I was doing, I would look at, and we were just doing it with like Facebook Live. I'm not that sophisticated. And... Um, they, uh, I would look, and there'd be like 300 people watching these things uh, from all over the world. Um, and actually, I guess in hindsight, that was probably good for the leather business because there's people that got a leather class that might never have had a chance to have one because they were stuck at home, and so it was probably good in that regard. But I wonder if you're here at the mm -hmm. store. Well, the, well the, I don't know. the lockdown was in effect here. We were busier than we've ever been as far as our mail order business went. Because of your website, because of, yeah, yeah, well, and telephones. Because everybody was at home. <laughs> All because of Jim. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
Yeah. Well, it, um, and I think that it's important that a lot of folks um, can be intimidated to just take off with a hunk of leather like this and start putting some design on it and getting somebody to kind of guide them through it can can help. Um, when did you start designing your own patterns? Uh, did you like to follow other people's patterns for a while? Oh, yeah, of course. I think we all do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I learned, you know, when I started out, all right, here comes the stories. Um, but when I started out, I, I grew up on a on a, a ranch. We were 50 miles from the nearest town. Mile City, Montana is the nearest town, but we lived 50 miles out from there. I actually went to a, a one-room schoolhouse for the first five years of my education. It was right across the county road from where we lived, and the teacher lived right there. So, And this is in Montana, so you know what? I never had a snow day, ever. We we never shut down school because I could always, my brother and I could always walk across the road and the teacher was there, so we had school. Um, and it, it So anyway, um, that's where I got uh, started in this and um, I we had a neighbor that did a little bit of leather work and I used to go over there and play with his stuff, but when we moved to town, which we had to move to town when my older brother got to high school age, um, so he could go to high school. Um, he went, uh, I then got a chance to, uh, to go to public school and they had in junior high school, they had industrial arts class. Back then, industrial arts is, you know, more of a vocational type thing for all you youngsters. Um, is a vocational type thing where people actually learned how to use, do things useful. Um, as opposed, <laughs> man, I'm about to get in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> Um, anyway, they. You yourself, yeah. yeah, I know. Um, but I, you know, you could try things out like like woodworking and metalworking and and uh, ceramics and jewelry oh, making and weaving. and <laughs> anyway. But leather was one of the things you could do, and and uh, that's where I got my my taste of it. And I found out that hey, this is kind of fun. Um, in fact, it, it's a lot of fun, and and I was even good at it. Um, so. Uh, I bugged my folks until I got a, a beginner set of, of tools out of them, which was the six basic stamping tools and, and a swivel knife and a wooden mallet, and that's what I had. But anyway, then in high school, you asked, I know you asked about how did I come around to designing patterns. Well, back then, all you had was the books that were put out by Tandy, which were largely done by Al Stolman. And then I would look at those books, and I'd look at the stuff he was doing, and, oh, my God, he was doing stuff that was just way beyond what I ever dreamed you could do with leather work. Um, and I tried to do it with those six basic tools, but they didn't always work. Um, so, um, But I did learn how to improvise and, and such, but... Uh, in high school, um, when I got into high school, we, they still had industrial arts or shop class, I guess they called it there, but um, uh, they had, uh, I, I could take that class and I could even just focus up on leather work and not even have to mess with anything else. And so that's what I did. And because it was an easy way to get a good grade without having to work very hard. Uh, I wasn't all that concerned about working hard in high school. I, I did a really good, I got straight A's and goofing off, um, and in leatherworking. So anyway, that that's where a lot of my leatherworking skills come from. But I wasn't designing my own patterns. I was just copying everybody else. I've used a lot of the craft aids, which now there are what do they call them? Carve aids. Carve rights. Carve rights. Okay. What we call them. Uh, that's what you call them, and it's kind of neat that they're coming around again, and and some new ones are going to be created. But um, they uh, that's what was available and I used to use those a lot I, you know obviously they're quick and easy and you can get a pattern on your leather I'd love to have one right now for this pattern <laughs> uh, but they don't make them for everything that's the thing you, you know yeah they don't make them you know to fit a shap yoke or you know 
Someone uh, has to tool one before they can make one. Right. So, you know, I, what I would do is I'd take those uh, craft aids and I'd rub off this flower here in this place and then I'd rub off a leaf over there or a scroll or whatever and, and then I'd, you know, connect the lines as best I could and kind of make it into a pattern. And, uh, and eventually it got to the point where, well, I could just sketch that in. I don't need to draw that whole thing. I don't need to use that, that tracing thing. So, um, so anyway, that it, 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 I got to where I was um, adapting patterns first. And then, but the more you do that, the, the more you realize that, well, I can just sketch that whole thing in there and you, you get familiar with what, what you can do with the tools that you have and anything. That, that, that's kind of how it started. But yeah, I've always drawn a lot. I was, in fact, I made my art teacher, that we had art there. And I, one year I signed up for the art class um, and uh, went in there for a few days and decided, man, this is just boring. They wanted me to like smear colors together. It just sounded so stupid. You know? do, do do, yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, that's, that's no fun. So I, I signed out of that and, and uh, went over to the and, and I made her mad because she said, you're doing better stuff than anybody here. But uh, I said, yeah, but it, it, this ain't art. By the way, going back to what I just did here, I'm sorry, I'm talking. Look, I, I had this tape down, right? Everybody else does too. And before I peeled that all the way away, you know what I did? I took it up from one corner and I looked at it and I did notice I'd missed a line over here. So I went, laid it back down and, and traced that line. Um, one of those things learned the hard way. I, you know, go ahead and just rip that off. Well, good luck lining everything back up again. You know, it just doesn't work. So make sure, you know, when you think you're done, before you like rip that away, uh, make sure that you uh, that you uh, have gotten it all on there. And then if you're going to do those corners, like I said, you can uh, you can take that uh, uh, that outline that's there and line that up, and you can put those corner patterns on there, and they'll be all perfectly spaced away from that oval in the center. If you wish to do that, they're they're kind of fun. I'm going to do a couple of well, I'll do them as well because you all are still tracing some of you. So anyway, that's how I got to, to drawing my own patterns and such. And, you know, that is kind of part of what we're going to share here, too, is about about those different types of designs and such. I want to... I did a, a book, well, a pattern pack. Well, I, I do have a book version of it, too. It's but you, I didn't bring any of those. They don't have those here. They do have the pattern pack with all the information in it, but if you want actually the book, uh, I have some of those on my website. But anyway, I did one on, on regional carving styles. And uh, the reason for the book, the reason for me doing that pattern pack was that I've noticed that a lot of folks don't realize that um, everything isn't Sheridan. <laughs> um, you know, you go out onto the internet or Facebook or wherever all these different leather groups get together and you'll find that everybody's talking about Sheridan and everybody's copying somebody else that's doing Sheridan. And I was over in Spain one time. Um, I got invited to teach at a Arts and Crafts Institute in Vigo, Spain, and I took along some samples and such to show folks. And, and uh, I had this one fellow come up and, and pick up one of the, the pieces that I had there, and it was just, you know, kind of a classic Western floral. There wasn't any particular style to it. And he said, man, I love this Sheridan style stuff. And I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? And he said, this, you know, with the flowers and all that. And I said, well, that's not really Sheridan. I didn't get into that and call him stupid or anything, but um, which I'm, I can do that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I, so I said, no, that's not really it. And, and, but I've had that kind of confusion a lot. Uh, people, um, because that is kind of the most popular or most seen, I guess, type of leather carving uh, style out there. And it's certainly the most recent. It's real easy for folks to think that, that that's, that's anything with a flower on it, that's got to be uh, Sheridan. And, of course, the next thing, the, you know, they'll... Anything with that where the pattern runs in a circular manner, they'll also assume that that's that's definitely got to be Sheridan, right? Um, anyway, hopefully I can show you a few things where some yeah, of that came from. All sorts of uh, 
types of, of carving in each like region and I, I look at those stuff and I to me it all just blends together. Yep. Well and it does, um, for a lot of folks. Um, the regional styles of, of leather carving, well, they, they came about because, well, there wasn't an internet. There wasn't a way to, um, for all these, everybody to copy everybody else. <laughs> um, and uh, what would happen, um, that's my phone, but you all can't hear it, can you? Um, the, uh, uh, the regional styles came about based really around the saddle shops. You know that they were the ones that, back in the day, you know that uh, they they wanted to reach beyond their their immediate circle where they were building stuff, and so they started doing saddle catalogs. And in fact, that's where I got a lot of the information about what these different regional styles are, is by looking at some of the saddle or some of the catalogs that came back came out when they started, you know. Um, trying to reach out with what they were doing, so um, and and as that got around, that's that's when those regional style animals actually started to be even known. But what would happen as a saddle maker over in Arizona? Well, he would kind of go learn from somebody else over in Arizona, and you know that those styles developed. So whoever was doing something, and especially if it was selling well, and and everybody like over at Porter Saddlery, if you know. They were kind of the big name over there. Um, uh, everybody, um, if you could do a saddle that looked just as good as what they were doing over at Porter's, well, you might be able to sell some. And, and so that's kind of how those regional styles uh, it came about. Um, that one, I don't know which one's going to be the oldest. Probably the stuff out in California is going to be probably your oldest style of carving. But, um, but anyway, that's... Uh, that's kind of how um, that stuff spread within those areas. In fact, going back to the, the Sheridan stuff, you know, that, that style of leather carving didn't even have a name. It, it didn't even, people in Sheridan didn't even call it Sheridan style carving. That, that term came about uh, when they started having that leather show there. They, that leather show's been going on in Sheridan now for about 25 years, maybe a little more, I don't remember. I've been to almost, I, well I have, all of them except maybe two or three, but um, what happened was though that that show as it grew in in fame and, and everybody started going to it from all over the place, they went there and they saw that, you know, all these people, all these saddle makers up in this area, they do a d different kind of leather carving. It's, it's got these tight little circles and stuff and, and smaller flowers and things like that. And um, that Sheridan style, you know, that's what we're talking about. Oh, so that's where that team came from. It got, it got labeled as a result of that show. Um, those guys in that area didn't call it Sheridan style. They weren't that self-centered to call it our own Sheridan style. They were just doing what they do, what everybody else does, and it's popular, you know. And yeah, Don King's the guy that evolved that quite a bit. But uh, you know where Don King, King got started? Well, he he was. Uh, he's his dad was a. Um, he used to break horses uh, and. So they traveled about from one ranch to the next doing that. Uh, in the summer months, they'd be up in Wyoming and Montana, Idaho, up in that part of the country, you know, during the summer months, breaking horses and doing ranch work and such. And then in the winter months, they tended to migrate south. And so they were down in Arizona one one year, and, and, and Don used to travel with his dad. I don't know what that family situation was, but I know he spent followed his dad around for that and anyway he had talented fell and he'd done some leather work but he went into um, Porter's uh, while they were down there and he said you know I I, I think I could help you tool some stuff and um, they you know this was when he would have been a, a teenager uh, and they said well um, go over here and visit with uh, this guy that he went they put him uh, over next to a guy by the name of Cliff Ketchum which was one of the guys that worked at at uh, Porter's at the time and very very awesome 
leather worker. I, I, he's one of those guys that I just really admire and respect his work. But anyway, he uh, they put him, took him over to and introduced him to Cliff Ketchum, and Cliff said, "Well, you got some tools, son?" And uh, no, I don't. He said, and he handed him some nails and bolts and stuff, and he said, "Well, make yourself some tools, and I'll show you how to run them." And uh, you know, if you go up to uh, Sheridan, the epic. Uh, that show that there's actually a museum up there that Don King was a heck of a collector. He he gathered up stuff from everybody, but also there's a lot of his own work. And if you look at some of the early work that he was doing, he uh, um, he he was uh, very much a Porter style carver. Some of his earliest saddles, it very much that. But yes, he evolved the the Sheridan style stuff. He's the guy that. That well, he shrunk down the flowers. The flowers got smaller, and they went tighter and more in circles. But the circle thing, I can. There's some patterns that come out of porters that use the circle flow and such like that. There's patterns that come out of the Arizona st uh, stuff that comes with that. I see a line I just missed too. Sorry. <laughs> um, the. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so but he he's the guy that that made all that stuff smaller, tighter, um, and so forth. And so he he certainly is the guy that gets the credit for that. So everybody's done tracing, right? Well, not my half. Oh, okay, no problem. When you're designing a pattern. Are you already thinking about? Um, the embellishments or the tools you're going to be using, like the and Yeah, I do a little bit. Um, I think more about it as far as size. Um, size? Yeah, yeah it, you know, you don't do like some really super small thing, and then all you got is big old tools here for doing saddle skirts. You know, you you, you kind of got to make sure you know what your tools will do when you're drawing them. Um, uh, back in the day when I was starting out, I I didn't draw my own, and but I'd still try to do them little patterns with my big old tools that I had. And you know what? You learn to improvise. You learn how to modify and and, and learn how to use the corner of a tool here and there and whatever it takes to to be able to to uh, to to accomplish what you're after. And that's one of the things. Um, that's one of the things I love about this pattern we're working on. Mine's kind of tore up here, but uh, uh, actually it's in the. Uh, uh, and these here at Springfield, they're carrying this. This is Montana influence patterns. All of these here, this this whole thing uh, was spurred out of that trip to Montana last year. Believe it or not, um, we had, um, and this pattern is in here. I'm, I'm going to find that pattern, but there's other stuff in here as well. Um, that, this knife sheath that you see here. This. Uh, the, we, the guy we rented an Airbnb from. He's. Uh, um, he was a. Uh, uh, stunt man in Hollywood, yeah, and he had this extra cabin up there, and and so that's what we rented. And he, when we got all done, he he was never around that much. He said, "Here, I want you to have this knife," and he gave me this big old Bowie knife that had an engraving on the side of it of two elk fighting and such. He says, "I want you to have this." I said, "I don't need no stinking knife." I mean, and and so anyway, I said, "Well, I'll tell you what, I'll take it." But I'm going to send it back because it was in the biggest piece of junk sheath you ever saw in your life. It was just crud. And so I took it and I, I carved him up a sheath um, to uh, to put on front of it. And I don't know if you, you can't see that. You're looking at me face on. Is, is what I'm seeing there what they're seeing? Yep, we'll, we'll switch it here. Okay, all right. That's fine. Uh, anyway, so I, I made this this uh, sheath for him, and, and because here's uh, here's two elk about to have that face off, you know, there, and so that's on the sheath. And then when you pull the knife out, engraved on the side of the knife is the two elk totally engaged. So anyway, and there's some fish, and the, yeah, here's the pattern. So um, anyway, the thing I like about this pattern is that. Uh, and, and and the the photos that you have there of how that started, he used what he had. You know, he he made do with what he had to do that, and that's that's kind of how we all start. He, I, um, with that, I, I, we we have we have tools that can just take a design like that and do wonders with it. You know, um, and that's uh, that's what we should do. There's a whole bunch of belt. I'd never seen a an aspen leaf belt before. Nobody, I, I'd never seen anybody make a belt pattern with aspen leaves. We had aspen leaves right outside our cabin. I said, well, why haven't we done that? Why didn't somebody? So I made an aspen leaf. I haven't carved it yet. Well, I carved that much of it so I could do this. And then these are some other old ones. These, a lot of these, when I used to work at 
um, that saddle shop, I did work for a saddle shop in Miles City for a while, um, or did all their custom work for a while. And anyway, these are the kind of quick, easy patterns that, that I would do. And so I thought, you know, those ought to be shared. So anyway, That's all I, in that bag? Yeah, all these are in here. So there's a whole slug of these designs in here. And uh, even this, uh, wherever he's at, where's the bear? He's right over there. Huh? Yeah, the bear, this bear. Um, this bear picture, um, yeah, that's another story. This, this was, there was a painting in, in uh, Charlie Russell's museum up there that was done by a guy by the name of Olaf Stelzig, and it had this bear the other direction, and it had this kind of a, um, a strange shape here for the, the mat, um, and it was a watercolor. It, it, it wasn't anywhere near as detailed as this, but I said, you know, that would work cool in leather. You could like have this bear kind of like coming out of the leather and such like that. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? So I swapped it around. I didn't want to look like I actually copied him, you know. So I swapped it around, made it the other direction and everything. And the first thing people say, hey, that's cool how you put that L in behind there. I wasn't thinking of that. <laughs> anyway, so all that's in there. Um, all those patterns are in there. But the, uh, yeah, I did that to get out the this one here that I tore up. There we go. Um, that's that's what's actually in there and uh, this pattern. So um, anyway, um, so now everybody's done tracing, right? Pretty close. <laughs> that's all right. I, I we have plenty of time. Everybody will get through it. And and you know what? Do not feel that you have to like race and and stay even with me. Um, that's not necessary. We are going to do some cutting next, though. Uh, and so I'm going to, before I start that, I'm going to put just a light amount of moisture on here again. It's it's still just right, but I, I, it's going to be a minute or two before I get started cutting. So I'm just going to make sure of this. And you know what I normally do if I'm working on a project like this and I'm going to be away from it for a minute? A lot of times I'll just turn it upside down on my t table like that because that just keeps the moisture in it. You know, it keeps it from drying out. So, um, but we're about to do a bunch of cutting, and uh, so you better make sure your knife is working right, right?